Welcome back to It's Your Case, presented by VetCT.com. I'm Heather Chalmers, your radiologist on demand for this week. Today's example is a 10-month-old Bernese Mountain Dog with left front limb lameness. We'll start by looking at two views of the carpus in manus. I'll share with you that when you examine this dog, the limb is diffusely very swollen and painful, and the limb is non-weight-bearing. In addition to the DP view, seen here, we also have the lateral view, and I'll zoom out so you can see it a little more clearly. While you're looking, in these cases, we're often using the radiographs to rule out a number of things, and we may be unsure about what the underlying cause of this diffuse swelling and severe lameness is. So we're thinking about, could there be a fracture? Could there be a septic process? And especially radiographically, we want to rule out septic arthritis. Um, is there any possibility of a juvenile orthopedic condition, given that it's a 10-month-old dog? So this is a great chance to practice our entire ABCDs process, which is my orthopedic sort of mnemonic that I use to ensure that I've looked at everything on every radiograph. ABCDs, you'll remember, is alignment, bone, cartilage, devices, which applies when patients have orthopedic implants, and S, soft tissues. So let's start with A for alignment. And we actually did radiograph quite a bit of the limb in this case, so I'm just zooming out so you can have a little look. I popped a yellow rectangle on the nutrient foramen so that we don't get distracted. This is normal remodeling at that level of the nutrient foramen in the interosseous region of the radius and ulna. My overall impression is that the alignment of the limb on the lateral view is appropriate, and I'm gonna to go to the DP view and have a similar kind of zoomed out overview and to me the alignment looks fairly appropriate. As I move on to B for bone, my process is that I trace all the bones on all the views. Of course this would take a little while and I would encourage you as you do this to move in, zoom in on each structure, move up and down each digit, and of course all the cuboidal bones of the carpus can be quite challenging. But for me, when I did this process, slowly and carefully, I was unable to see a fracture at any level in this case. So in our kind of process of using these radiographs to help rule out some causes of severe lameness and limb swelling, I think so far we can say we don't see any evidence of fracture or any malalignment. Also, as we were going through, I didn't see any evidence of a specific juvenile orthopedic disease. So examples would be things like panosteitis, or hypertrophic osteodystrophy. You can see that the physes are appropriately closed for this age of, of dog. So the next thing, and we practiced this last week, is to look at C for cartilage, which is fits nicely into our mnemonic, but what we're really looking at is the radiographic joint space. So we're looking at these lucent spaces um, of the carpus, and of course, once we get below the carpus, we've got all kinds of joints to look at. We have the metacarpal phalangeal joints, of digits two, three, four, and five. And then each of those digits is gonna have proximal and distal interphalangeal joints between the proximal, middle, and distal phalanx. And of course the distal phalanx is where we also have the nail. So I would go through and look at all of these joints and you might see that the metacarpal phalangeal have these beautiful, easy to trace radiographic joint spaces. And then when we get into the um, digits, you can see that the proximal interphalangeal joint is not very well seen and is almost kind of looked um, very different. We don't see a crisp radiographic joint space, whereas the distal interphalangeal, we see it a little bit better. Be really careful not to overread that. Remember, whenever you find something, always go to the other view. So let's go to the other view. You can see, this is gonna be hard to kind of convince ourselves, but you can see that on, um, when we look at the digital joints, that there's actually a, sort of a, there's gonna be an element of superimposition or obliquity. I'm gonna go back because in fact, the DP view shows this better. So when we're looking at this proximal interphalangeal joint, I think the reason that we don't see a crisp radiographic joint space is due to the shape of that joint. It's a little bit obliqued relative to the X-ray beam. And then just with the curve of the digit, we have a little bit better view of that joint. So for me, I'd be comfortable that we don't have any evidence of subchondral lysis. That's what we were looking for last week too. And when we're interested in subchondral lysis, you'll recall, we just trace that subchondral joint 
um, that subchondral bone plate and we kind of look at see how smooth it is and it can take a lot of practice to get used to sort of reading through this obliquity and of course if we're looking at even larger joints especially in horses for those of you that deal with um, equine species we can have a lot of superimposition and obliquity of the joints because the joints are simply so large the next thing that we would look at after our C for cartilage would be devices, which are not present here. So let's move on to look at S for soft tissues. One of the reasons that I wanted to share this case um, with everyone today is that I think that we sometimes um, are guilty or I am sometimes guilty of kind of undervaluing radiographs when it comes to soft tissue changes. One thing that can be really helpful if you have a, a limb that's really swollen Radiographs can be helpful to determine if that swelling is centered on the joint or if it's more centered on the soft tissues or diffusely in the limb. The thing that I use to help me with that, one, you just do that kind of bird's eye zoomed out look and you can see that the soft tissues on the caudal aspect of the antebrachium and the dorsal aspect, as well as on all aspects of the carpus and metacarpus, the soft tissues are diffusely thick. It's not particularly worse in one spot or another. So that can be quite helpful. And you may think that that is something that you can determine on physical examination, and that would be true in many cases, but the radiographs can be helpful, especially when limbs are diffusely swollen, to really get a better idea of how it's centered. So this seems quite diffuse. If I'm interested in determining whether it's intracapsular, so swelling within the joint, or extracapsular, swelling around the joint, I think that radiographs can be helpful, but it does depend a little bit on the radiographic quality, and it also depends on which joint. So when we're talking about the carpus, we have extensor tendons that run across the dorsal aspect, and we have flexor tendons that run across the palmar aspect. Most of those have little fat pads and very um, small sort of fascial planes around them. And radiographically, fascial planes are usually um, a fat opacity if they show up. So I see a little bit of sort of a fat opacity here, which I think is probably one of the carpal fat pads. I don't see specific swelling centered on here or particularly displacing the carpal fat pad. Um, I can also see a fascial plane running the whole way up the limb. You see a radial lucent line. If I were to trace it, it kind of zips up like this. Let's take this bigger area out of the way for a minute. This is a subcutaneous fascial fat plane. So this is telling me that this swelling starts immediately in the subcutaneous tissues and it doesn't look like it's particularly centered at the joint. So for me, I would conclude that this is extra capsular swelling. This view can be a little bit trickier with regard to seeing, of course, those um, dorsal and palmar extensor and flexor tendons, but you can get another kind of view here of that subcutaneous fatty fascial plane. One more thing that I'd like to mention, which I didn't comment on when we were going through bone, the other structure, um, the other bony structures of the manus and pes in dogs would be the sesamoid bones here. The sesamoid bones are part of the metacarpal phalangeal joint and occasionally you're going to find a sesamoid bone that might be what we call bipartite or in two pieces. It's actually hard to confirm on the other view if this is the case but my sense is that this is possibly a bipartite sesamoid bone. They're often incidental but they can be a cause of pain in some individuals so I usually just recommend targeted palpation of this area. It certainly would not cause diffuse limb swelling as we've seen um, in this patient and on these radiographs. So taking together our list of rule outs, I think we can say from today that we've excluded fracture. We can exclude joint um, erosive joint disease like septic arthritis because we don't see subchondral bone lysis. And this also appears to be very much an extracapsular soft tissue swelling. I think that um, some differentials we could consider would be cellulitis of any cause, whether it be infectious, immune-mediated, inflammatory. But be sure to review the full report associated with this case. Thanks for listening, and remember, it's your case, so please post your questions on social media.